Welcome to New Life, either if you're online or in person. I'm glad you're here. I'm Jimmy, the pastor here at New Life. And what a beautiful day today, right? Oh, we should be outside. It's going to be coming soon, I think. We're going to have to be outside again soon. Uh, the way I usually start every week is with a discussion question. Kind of get those brain, brain, whatever. See, I need to get my brain firing right now. So this is a good way to just kind of connect and get the brain flowing the way it should and everything. So my question this week, because I want to think about positive things. I want to think, you know, I mean, there's so much negativity all around. So on a positive way of thinking, what's the best compliment you ever got? And I'll be looking on Facebook, and I'll be looking on Instagram. I hope to see some answers on, hear from all of y'all. But those of you that are here, what is the best compliment you ever received? See, this is why we have to think about these things, positive things, because nobody can think anything, right? You gotta have something that somebody says that was good. You're killing me. What's that? Have a good day, man. Okay, well then. That's the best, man. Okay, Doug, you are a hard-working man. There, I give you a good compliment. Somebody else had to have had a good compliment. I'll do a good job. There you go. All right. Anybody else? Something, please. You're a good parent. Perfect. I'm proud of you. There you go. Oh, I love that one. That's like my favorite. And that's what I like to say, you know, tell people. I'm proud of you. You know, and that's like that means so much when somebody says that to me, especially like my, when my dad used to say that. And the best compliment that I ever got was actually not just for directed at me, but when we were working youth ministry at, back in Indiana, some one of the students said, "I want a marriage like Jimmy and Cheryl," which for real, I, I have to say. That was definitely, we, it could have been a good marriage without God being first and being involved. And without a whole lot of work and a whole lot of patience and perseverance from my wife. Patience and perseverance, refusing to give up and choosing to love me even in the times when I was the least lovable. So today, if I can get my mouse to work. We're going to continue our series in the book of Revelation. We, we started last week in the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches. And we learned last week that these were letters that Jesus himself spoke to John, and he told John to record these letters. And while they were addressed to specific churches of the time, there's a word for all all generations. Anyone who has to hear, let them hear. So we've got ears. We should be hearing them as well. This is the second letter, and this is the letter to the church of Smyrna. A little bit of background on Smyrna. It's about 25 miles northwest of Ephesus, where we, the city that we studied last time, the church that we studied. And Smyrna is so old that there's actually no record of its beginning, the city beginning. It's been around since before there was actually records of those kind of things. It was well known for being a place of science, medicine, and wealth. And it was rebuilt several times. There were you know, times where somebody came in and conquered and tore it down, but it, it kept on rebuilding, kept on growing. And today it's known as the Turkish, Turkish city of Izmir. In that day, it was loyal to the Roman Empire. So they were kind of allowed to reign, or rule themselves, govern themselves, but they were under the, the rule, of, uh, rule of the Roman Empire. It was a very pagan city. It was the home of the first temple of the goddess Roma. And it also was the home of the temple for the emperor Tiberius. It was a center for cult uh, and the cult of emperor worship. Under the emperor 
Demathan, there was emperor worship. It became a law. You had to, everyone was required to burn incense, incense in worship to Caesar. And everyone who did got a certificate verifying that they were worshiping Caesar. And if you didn't have proof that you did, you were basically taking your life in your own hands. You could be punished, you could even be put to death if you couldn't prove that you were worshiping Caesar. So the Christians in Caesar, Christians in Smyrna, had a difficult time because they refused to bow down to Caesar, putting them in danger. They faced persecution unlike anything I personally have ever experienced. I don't think any of us have really experienced that kind of persecution. We've had some difficulty, sure, sometimes our beliefs, we get challenged to possibly compromise our beliefs, but nothing compared to what the church in Smyrna had to deal with. Nothing that really even, I can't even qualify it as persecution. I might call it resistance or a little bit of difficulty, but this, their lives depended on it. Their lives depended on even though they stood for what they believed, there was a chance that they could die. I believe in our lifetime we may experience that. So what can we, as followers of Christ, learn from the church in Smyrna? We're in Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11. And it's the shortest of the letters to the churches from Jesus. And it begins like this. And to the angel in Smyrna, write these things, says the Lord. Or, <clears throat> to the angel of Smyrna, write these things. These things, the first, the last, who is dead, who came to life, says. Let me try that again. These things says the first and the last, who is dead and who came to life. So these, this was, again, Jesus begins the letter by identifying the fact that he is the one speaking to them. While John is just recording it, Jesus is the one that actually is speaking. He says he is the first, the last, so he's been around forever. He's the beginning, the end, the Alpha and the Omega. He was once dead. He was crucified, but he came back to life. So this is significant for their situation because it's an encouragement in what they're going through, which we'll be talking about soon, and in this persecution. If I sent you a letter and said, Okay, you guys, you're doing a great job. I want you to be faithful, even to the point of death. You guys would look at me like I got two heads, right? Because who am I? How can I even speak into that and say, be faithful to the point of death when I haven't experienced it? You'd be like, sure, Jimmy. But Jesus gave his life and is alive today. He can speak into that. This is the voice of the one for whom they and we can draw strength. He suffered unto death to deliver us from death. He's making a declaration. I have conquered death. You no longer need to fear it. Verses 8 through 10, Jesus continued to speak into their situation. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, and you may be tested, but you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. So Jesus starts by saying, I know. Not I've heard these things, you know, I've heard rumors, I feel sorry for you, but I know. I am here. I've been with you through all this. Everything you've been going through, I have been with you. I have perfect knowledge, is what the verb actually means in this text. I have perfect knowledge of what you're experiencing. Nothing we experience, nothing they experience, is outside of the knowledge and understanding of Jesus. <clears throat> so he knows, what does he know then? He knows their works, he says. Like the church in Ephesus, the letter in that in that letter, Jesus said, I know your works. But now in this letter to Smyrna, he doesn't have the but. He says, I know your works. I know the good things you're doing. 
He doesn't say, I hold these things that you're not doing right against you. The church in Smyrna remained faithful in this time of difficulty. They were still remaining in the Lord. Jesus was still their first love. They remained faithful, and Jesus acknowledged that and commended them, them for that. What else does he know? He knows their tribulation. He's aware of their suffering and the persecution. He's aware of what's been going on, like I just described, that they were possibly put to death. They were in prison. They were thrown in jail. They were facing death. He knows their pain. He knows the temptation of that. When you get in a tight situation, you, you want to find any way out possible. And there's a the temptation to possibly bow down to Caesar and to worship Caesar in this situation, to spare their own lives. Jesus understood that because he was tempted. When he was in the garden, before he was arrested, he was praying and asking the Father that the cup be passed from him, that he could not die if there was a way. He understood what it meant to be facing death. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet is without sin. Nothing they or we have ever experienced is outside of the realm of the understanding of Jesus. So what else does Jesus know? From this letter, he says that he knows their poverty. Now we're talking real poverty, not, oh, my life is hard, I can't afford a Dunkin' Donuts, ice, mochaccina, freckle, laka, ding dong, whatever it is. We're talking about true poverty. They were destitute. They didn't have the money for basic needs. They were outcasts because of their faith in Jesus and their unwillingness to compromise, they were denied opportunities to earn a living. But Jesus says, you're rich. I know you're, po you're poor right now. I know you're destitute right now, but you're rich. When everything appeared bleak, Jesus is saying, speaking into that situation, saying this is temporary. This earth, this stuff is temporary. Your re reward is not restri restricted to this temporary earth. If we live to be 80, 85 years old, it's considered a long life. But that life is nothing compared to eternity. The question is, what are we investing in? Are we investing in eternity? In the kingdom of God, the, his riches last forever. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is saying, you've earned your ticket to heaven. The only way you get received eternal life is through faith in Jesus. But the things that they were doing, the seeds they were sowing for the kingdom were earning additional blessings when they do get to heaven. When this life is over, we can still receive blessings. And I don't even, I can't even comprehend it, but Jesus is saying, you're rich in your future in heaven. What else does Jesus know? He knew the blasphemy of those that were saying they were Jews, but they weren't. They claimed to be God's chosen, because the Jewish people were God's chosen people. But Jesus is saying, being God's chosen people is not all about blood. These people have rejected Jesus. They, not the church, but the other people in, the, in Smyrna, rejected Jesus. They went along with the pagan ways of the Roman Empire. They did the things to, to save their own necks for one thing, and they believed the lies that the, that Caesar was a god, is what, they, what Caesar said. He, he claimed he was a god, proclaimed himself as a god. And these, these supposed Jews went along with that. Jesus said that is not being a true Jew. That's not being a true chosen people of God. They worshiped this emperor. They worshiped the false gods. And these people, these false Jews, actually even persecuted and encouraged the death of the people that refused to bow down to Caesar. 
Christ followers. They turned against God. They were not spiritually devoted to Jesus, meaning they were his enemies. They were described as the synagogue of Satan. That's one compliment or term I don't ever want associated with me. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be considered a synagogue of Satan. Back then it was referring to those who said they were Jews, but were not living as Jews, were not living as God's chosen people. Today, it can apply to those who claim to be Christians, but are Christians in, in name only. They, that don't do the things that God has said to do. That don't put God first. That have lost, left their first love. Think about it. If we're not in submission, full submission to Jesus, if we've not been transformed by Jesus, we're not a temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't have a welcome environment where the Holy Spirit feels welcome to be with us and live and dwell in us. We're a temple of Satan. Jesus knew what the church in Smyrna was experiencing. And he spoke into that. He said, do not fear. He knew the past, what had happened, and what was about to transpire. The next thing that was going to happen. And he knew who was causing this situation, that Satan was the one causing it. And he knew that Satan was about to cause some to be thrown into prison. Why was this going to happen? For testing. 1 Peter 1, 6-7 says, In this I greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith may uh, be much more precious than gold that perishes through it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We can be tested. Often when we're in difficult times, when we're frustrated, when we nothing is going right in our lives, when we just feel completely lost and alone, we think, we say, Oh, God's punishing me, right? We've said it, right? God's punishing me. I'm going through this tough time. God must be punishing me. Or, he's abandoned me. Where is he? He's not here for me anymore. But this is a message for all of us. Jesus is right there. He knows what's happening. He knows what's going on. He, he's not waiting for you to slip up. And then, it's just, ha! Now I can punish them. Now I can get them. He's not, that's not Jesus. That's not God, that's not his personality, that's not anything that is even like him. But we like to say that because the enemy convinces us that Jesus is like us, that God is like us, and that he will be just looking for those problems. We like to, the enemy likes to tell us that Jesus has turned away, that he's not there for you. He's always there. We're living in a fallen world that's chosen to stray from him. How we respond is up to us. We need to persevere, push through, like Smyrna did. Continue to love, continue to trust, continue to obey God, like the Smyrna believers did. How much do we trust Jesus? Is it enough to be unwilling to compromise? To stop blaming him for the consequences of our actions? Or is it even this lost world around us? These trials and te testings might seem long. I'm sure they seem long. And Jesus said to this church, they'll last for 10 days. I don't know. There's not any proof whether it was actually a 10 days, literal 10 days, or symbolic 10 days. But the point is, it's temporary. It's that while you're on this earth, and while you're on this earth, Jesus will see you through it. He's there. He's aware. He's with you. So Jesus said, continues by saying, be faithful. It's a call to a habitual action of faith. Continue doing the things displaying faith. Keep believing. Don't give in to the temptations of the world, even if it costs you your life. Beginning of the letter, Jesus said, He's the first, the last, the one who is dead, who came to life. 
This is our Lord, our living Savior, the one who conquered death. He's the only one that's qualified to give this call in our lives, to remain faithful. And when we do, when the church of Smyrna does, did, Jesus said, you will be rewarded. He'll give them the crown of life. Now that's not like you're a king or a queen. This crown in this situation is talking about like in the old days when uh, an athlete competed, like in a race. They competed in the race and the winner of the race won this crown of some you know, fancy crown that was like made out of plants and stuff and it was like a wreath on their head. And it was a reward for completing, for a job well done, for never giving up, all the time trusting in the Lord. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my spot there. Never giving up, all the times that we have doubt and waver, we need to push through. We need to refuse to give up. When we're feeling financially, spiritually, mentally, emotionally bankrupt. We feel the inner, po inner poverty. We can have peace knowing that Jesus, through Jesus and his sacrifice, our debt is paid. Our spiritual debt is paid. Nothing this world can throw at us can harm us. Our account is full of forgiveness, peace, hope, promise. That's the only lasting wealth. We're rich in the Lord Jesus. Paul can, or John records and Jesus can, continues this letter saying to the church in Smyrna, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by a second death. So like I said, this is to seven historical churches, one specifically, but these seven letters are to seven historical churches that actually were on the earth at the time, and they were meant, spoken directly to them, but Jesus said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's us. That's all generations that follow. All seven letters apply to all generations. They address real situations. Time is coming. I believe the time is coming when this earth, this earth is going to end. There's going to be a second death that Jesus is talking about here. Second death. We may not last another few years. Who knows? You can walk outside and get hit by a bus, right? That's what they always say. But we don't know. And we are going to face a physical death. But after that, when this world ends, there will be a second death. There will be judgment. Those that are found without Jesus will have a second death. And that second death is eternal. Eternal punishment and death and judgment for being found without Jesus. But Jesus says the church in Smyrna doesn't need to fear. If you're found in Jesus... You don't have to fear a second death. We don't have to fear a second death if we're found in Jesus. So what's the takeaway from this? Persecution, poverty, and oppression, like this church of Smyrna, nothing stops them. Jesus said, I'm with you through this all. And if you continue, you persevere. If you refuse to compromise, you're going to receive reward. That's, that should be an encouragement to all of us. Whatever we have faced, whatever we may face, Jesus is with you. I believe we're in the beginning of the end times. The stuff that's talked about in the book of Revelation that's coming up. I believe there's a time that God's preparing a place for us right now. I believe it's almost time for us to be there. The things that I've seen, the stuff that I've watched on the news are setting up for the end of the world. The body of the Christ is beginning to experience persecution now. And it's just going to get worse. Just recently I saw a video of a pastor in Canada. 
there was police that came in and they tried to get them to stop meeting. Tried to force them to stop their meeting, their church meeting. And this pastor refused. He said, get out, get out, get out of my church. You have no jurisdiction. And they didn't, they have no, had no jurisdiction. They just decided, well, this group can't congregate because of COVID, right? I believe COVID is being used as an excuse to stop people from congregating, stop the church body from meeting together. I love that we have internet. I love that we're able to share the message with the world. But we're a body of Christ. We are called to meet together, to build one another, one another up, to spur each other on to acts of mercy and love to grow together and to grow in the Lord. But the day is coming when they're probably not going to allow us to meet in churches someday. The cancel culture is going to stop the Bible from being being allowed because we don't like what it says. Somebody doesn't like it's offensive to somebody. Oh, somebody might be hurt by the feelings. It says not to do this. That God's word always remains true and faithful. But this culture, the world that we're, we see coming over the horizon is going to be doing everything possible. The enemy, Satan, is lurking around like a roaring lion, lion ready to kill and devour. History repeats itself. Stuff that the persecution that they experienced in Smyrna, that is going to repeat. And the Bible predicts in Revelation that these things are going to happen. The time will come. We don't know when, but we have to choose. Are we going to reject God or die? It might happen. There may be a time when you have to choose. Take a mark or die. What's your choice going to be? An eternity with Jesus or eternal death and wrath and punishment. Before the great tribulation that's described in the book of Revelation is upon us, we need to begin a pattern now. We need to begin the pattern of faithfulness now. Choosing Jesus in every situation. Resisting temptation. Pride, lust, gossip, and anger. We experience those. Those are just tiny compared to the possibility of denying Jesus or dying. Leaving your first love is idolatry. When you put anything above and before Jesus, it's idolatry. If we deny Jesus in these little things, these little temptations, these little trials that happen in our lives right now here in these easy days, I'm we might think it's hard, but right now we're in some pretty easy days compared to what's coming. If we deny Jesus in our actions, in our words now, how can we know without a doubt that we'll remain faithful when, it, when our eternity depends on it? If we're not living a life of submission now to Jesus, how will you be affected by second death? Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone, this is Jesus speaking, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. You can add in, go to church in your name. Even put money in the offering box in your name. Serve the homeless in your name. But if we're not completely in submission to Jesus, if we're not making him our Lord, he doesn't know us. So in I'm going to end with a story. This is a true story about a member of the church of Smyrna. Second century church leader. His name was Polycarp. He knew the Apostle John personally. He was a leader in the church. 
and he died a martyr's death for refusing to acknowledge Caesar as and as the Lord and sacrificing to Caesar. When he was told to deny Christ, to give up his faith in Christ, he responded by saying, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior now? You threaten me with fire that burns for a season, and after a little while is quenched. But you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment. That in the company of martyrs I may share the cup of Christ. But you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. Then he prayed, I bless you, Father. Before he was killed, he prayed, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour, so that in the company of martyrs I may share this cup of Christ. Jesus knew what Smyrna was going through, knew what the believers in Smyrna were going through. He knows your situation as well. Do you know him? Have you made him Lord of your life? We're not called to just ask Jesus into our heart, attend church as long as we don't get a better offer on Sunday morning, or as long as we're not too tired to roll out of bed. And that be the only determining, uh, discerning factor between us and the world. Living like the world the rest of the week, but for, you can. I can sacrifice an hour of my time, you know. Jesus, yeah, I can squeeze in for about an hour, and then I'm good, right? He wants to be your Lord. And as such, if we make him our Lord, we will be overcomers. All you need to do is to pray. To believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Really, truly, honestly, Believe, not just say it because they're words, not just give Jesus God lip service, but believe that Jesus is the Lord, that the things that the Bible tells us are true, that Jesus died for our sins, paid the penalty for our sins, and rose again, and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So today, are you willing, are you ready to not just be a churchgoer, to not be a part-time believer when it's convenient, but to completely give your life to Christ. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what we can learn from these churches that you speak to in Revelation. We thank you that even thousands of years later, you're still speaking through your word. Lord, I pray that anyone that needs to make a decision like that, gives their lives to you, submits to you before it's too late. In Jesus' name, amen.